I had no right to use physical force to injure anyone under any circumstances, and that that was no way to resolve conflict, period. Hello, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 566, with today's guest, Sensei Daniel Korenguth. I'm Jeremy Lasniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and everything we do here is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn all about our projects and our products. It's also the easiest way to find the store where you can, guess what, buy stuff. And if you buy stuff, maybe you'll find a shirt or who knows, there's all kinds of stuff. It's changing all the time. And you can use the code PODCAST15 and it'll save you 15% off. And it lets us know that this show leads to sales because you know what? The show costs money. We're doing everything we can to make it pay off. And by pay off, we mean deliver value to you. So maybe you'll do something for us. What else could you do for us? Well, you could share an episode. You could leave a review. You could buy a book on Amazon. There's a ton of stuff you could do. Just think about what would Whistlekick want? What could we do? What would make Jeremy smile today? Go do that and I'll be thrilled. If you want to check out the website for the show, you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two episodes every week, and it's all under the guise of connecting, educating, and entertaining the martial artists, the traditional martial artists specifically of the world. That's you. That's probably you. Hopefully it's you. If not, why not? You should start training. In addition to those other ways I mentioned that you could support us, we've got a Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. Not only is Patreon a place that you can support us and help us offset the cost of this show, but it's a place where we give back even more. In fact, yes, for every bit that you contribute, we've got different tiers over there. We're going to give you more stuff back. You give us two bucks a month, we're going to give you some blog posts. You give us five, we're going to give you some exclusive audio. Ten, you get a video show, and it goes up from there. So check that out, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Today's guest had some great stuff to say. I, I don't know how to do an intro for this one. We had a wonderful conversation. We talked about, yeah, martial arts and how we got started and all that. But this one, more than most, defies any kind of neat packaging up for the introduction section. So I'm, I'm not going to try. I'm just going to let you listen, and then I'll, I'll see you at the end. Sensei Korngooth, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. Appreciate your time. And, you know, we just had a pretty good chat audience. You know, one of the things I'm always very aware of is that when, when you listen to an episode, you, you get the intro and then you get the beginning of the conversation where we define it. And for some guests, that's immediately when they sign on to zoom for others, it's 10, in this case, 15 minutes of conversation before we get there. And, and I'm always amazed at how different that let's call it pre-show conversation is we, we we started to get into some good stuff and i'm glad we we kind of we kind of stopped because i want to make sure we we share that with the audience yes i actually found our our dialogue really stimulating as well it already got me thinking about things <laughs> and uh and discussion topics good good well you know i i get a feeling when i when i bring a guest on you know is this going to be a succinct episode or is this going to be one of those episodes that yeah we keep an eye on the time but if if we weren't doing that, if we were sitting down, maybe having a couple drinks or or just, you know, at a restaurant, you know, it might turn into two, three, seven hours of conversation. And I've got a feeling you're closer to the latter than the former. Well, thank you. And I, I do like having conversations over drinks as well. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Maybe we'll have to make that happen. You're not that far away. If COVID ever goes away, I would <laughs> if it ever goes away. Oh. Talk talk about talk about a, a well. No, let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about it because everybody's talking about it. And let's let's let martial arts radio be a bit of a reprieve because I need it. Even if nobody else needs it, I I need it. I need I need this time to talk about other things like martial arts. We're talking about martial arts. So if we if we roll your your tape back, if we look at your origin story, you know, if we want to we want to play superheroes. You know, what what would issue one of the Daniel comic book look like? You know. I would be sitting in a therapist's office, and I'm not joking. And we would be discussing the idea as I come to grips with this reality that I have been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder oh, in my early 30s. Um, my therapist, who was just this great guy, 
at the time said, wait, wait a second. I thought you, I thought you knew you had attention deficit disorder. And I said, well, no, I actually never, it never even occurred to me. I just thought it was one of those, you know, blanket diagnoses that they throw around willy nilly. And he's like, nah, now I knew you were ADD the second you sat in my office six years ago, because you asked me to turn my, my water feature off because it was distracting you. And only attention deficit disorder people do that because most people find it relaxing. Hmm. And that would be where the sort of uh, journey begins. And from there, I started doing research because I had been very reluctant to the diagnosis because I was afraid that it would, um, it would be like a crutch, that I would say, oh, you know, of course I can't show up on time because I'm ADD. Or, oh, of course I can't pay my bills because I'm ADD. But what I started learning was that the discrete symptoms of this condition are really fascinating. And when you start kind of teasing them out of all of the crazy cultural prejudices, it actually can be a, a diagnosis like this can actually be a great tool to restructuring one's life. And for me, a lot of these dis, you know, dis, seemingly disparate phenomenon, I'd never understood you know, why I was a certain way or why, I, why my brain functioned the way it did, I came to understand a couple things. One, I mean, we call it attention deficit disorder. And I think a disorder is already an unfortunate pejorative term because to have a brain like mine and like so many others has a lot of benefit and some really cool parts. Um, it's when you try to like squeeze it into the, the box that is our culture that it doesn't always work out so good. Um, but also the diagnosis was a, a great tool for me to come up with um, some basic strategies to ameliorate the negative effects and um, kind of cultivate the positive facets of the of the condition. Hmm. So I did some research, and in almost every book I read, they said, you know, eat less carbohydrates, less processed foods, less processed sugars, more proteins sleep better, get a physical fitness regimen, and then most of the books would tell you to go and get on you know, Adderall or some sort of uh, speed, you know, time lapse speed uh, your brain. And a few of the books mentioned a mindfulness practice. So at that time in my life, I had neither a mindfulness practice nor an exercise regime. So I started sort of doing the things that one might normally do, like go to the gym with a friend, which I despise because I'm a very social person. I'm very gregarious. And the gym culture is 100% anathema to people like me. Um, you're supposed to all be together and, and not acknowledge each other, which just doesn't make any sense. But I guess that's what you're supposed to do. Some people love that. But for me, if I'm in public working out, I'd like to be able to say hello and ask them questions about how to use the treadmill. That was all not well received. So I didn't like the gym too much. And then I tried aerial fabrics because I live in Brattleboro, Vermont, where we have a circus arts school. Mm -hmm. And you can like, you know, do aerial fabrics. And uh, I actually liked that a lot for, um, it did get me in shape and I started to lose some weight. It also provided me with more flex than I'd ever had before that point. But the class structure was one where, you know, it would go in a six or eight week cycle and then there'd be a lag and you'd sign up for the next session. Um, and so in that way, I started to lose my ability to maintain, uh, like a, like a momentum. And then my, I was, I also played Dungeons and Dragons and I don't mean to, you know, out Andrew here, but, um, <laughs> we've played Dungeons and Dragons together. I don't think you would mind. I'm pretty sure he said that at some point publicly. Okay, good. Cause otherwise you'd have to have that. But, uh, one of my Dungeons and Dragons, uh, friends trained at a martial arts dojo here in Brattleboro, and he was trying to get me to come because I explained my, my struggles with finding a good physical fitness regimen. Um, and he, he talked about uh, uh, karate. And at that time, I was 100% against the idea. My only concepts of karate were something like uh, Napoleon Dynamite, you know, where you have this guy in Star Spangled Bender parachute pants and a mullet, um, shouting, you know, bow to your sensei, I'll teach you what I learned after six seasons in the octagon, and you know, that sort of stuff. And to my mind, okay, so I was um, 
I was an avowed pacifist and very anti, you know, anti-authority punk rock ethos. So all the things that he was describing sounded like all things that I would hate. But he's like, look, man, you just come and give it a shot. If you don't like it, you know, you get a couple sessions free. No one's, you know, you're not signing a contract. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come back. So I went to my first session. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was in a, in Patrick Donahue's show and room martial arts school when it was at a different point up on Putney Road in a kind of what is now a tattoo parlor. And um, I was taught a basic form, a four directional form, and a few stances. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, you know what? There is absolutely no way I can stand the way they're telling me to stand. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense from a physiological point of view, but I'll do my best. The class was over in a blink of an eye. I got a good sweat going. And I saw this amazing um, community where there was, in the sense of community, there was communion. There were people gathering together in mutual support of one another's um, advancement and personal development. That struck me right off the bat. And yeah, there were a lot of formalities that looked a lot like mindless, cultish, slavishness um, that, that were triggering my punk rock uh, the punk rocker within me. But um, I came back after the second class, and one of the things that I liked, and we did briefly mention this, and of course I made a silly joke, but the truth is I do pick up forms quickly. I didn't know that about myself, but um, after the second class, I'd have this simple four-directional form down. Uh, my form was god-awful, but I, I had the basics of the structure. And strangely, I found a place that worked for me. I found a place where I could work out, get a sweat, get some physical fitness going. I had no idea that the mindfulness component would be something that I cherished down the road and was really meaningful to me. But at that moment, all I knew was I was doing stuff with my body that made sense. I was engaged in an activity that took me entirely out of my daily life. And uh, for that, I was was really appreciative. Um, and that, that's sort of the uh, how I embarked on this process, yeah. basically in a nutshell. I was diagnosed with ADD. I had to go find something to do, and I I, I stumbled reluctantly into martial arts. Well, I I want to I want to go back, and maybe maybe we'd end up at if that was issue one, maybe we'd end up at issue zero as we talk about this as part of your origin story. I want to talk about the pacifism. Oh yes, yeah. Because that's I, I think like... most people are, you know, I, I don't know too many people who say, you know, I love violence. Yeah, and so. The majority of the world seems to be in this kind of default sort of neutral place. But to say that, that one is a pacifist, to me, says that there's a piece of a story there. And I'm wondering if you might share whatever that might be. Yeah. And I would actually love for this to be one of the sort of threads of our conversation today. Okay. Um, so pacifism for me was something that I adopted. First of all, I guess like the first thing I need to say is at this point, and even even before I started exploring martial arts, which by definition is an activity that is in some way linked to the concept of combat, as well as exercising power and relating to, in some way, relating to violence. So um, even before I became a martial artist, I didn't like the term pacifism. Um, although my the way I the way I used, or the way I, what should I say, the way I believed that pacifism should be expressed was actually in many ways that. It was passive. It was just not, not only nonviolent, but a lot of uh, avoidance of, of conflict of any type or variety. So, um, you know, interpersonal conflict, professional conflict, social conflict was something that I was very, very resistant to and internal conflict. So, you know, things about myself that, that maybe needed some improving. But in terms of how I expressed it, when people tried to engage me violently, I 100% refused to engage in violence. Um, and it goes back to just a sort of simple event. When I was 12 years old, I had a best friend, and he 
and I were really close. Maybe I was 12 going on 13. I'm not sure. Right around that time. It must have been 13. And um, I got a girlfriend. And I thought that I was, you know, kind of the coolest guy around, probably. And my friend didn't really appreciate my new sort of airs. And it escalated into an actual like fist fight, right? So we, and we were really, you know, 12 or 13. So we had it all planned out. It was going to be almost like a duel and we're going to meet at this park. And, you know, long story short, it was over pretty quickly. He gave me a left hook and broke my nose. But it was a really profound moment because I realized at that moment from the injury that I sustained that I never wanted to, uh, I, I felt that it was, I had no right to use physical force to injure anyone under any circumstances, and that that was no way to resolve conflict, period. And from there, I led my life, which is kind of funny because I was actually exposed to a lot of violence, but I didn't really analyze it very closely. But, uh, you know, I got beat up a lot. I uh, used to get in trouble with the law, so I had a lot of run-ins with the cops who are, by the way, all the ones that I was interacting with were not pacifists. I guess whatever the, op you know, you say not many people say they like violence. These guys might not have admitted it, but they sure demonstrated their, uh, their love of violence. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was a, I'm a punk rocker. So I, you know, we go to punk rock shows. I love to mosh and um, would sometimes experience intentional violence um, from skinheads or things along these lines. So in my life, I encountered quite a bit of violence up until, you know, even up until close to the time I got into martial arts, but my reaction was to not respond with violence. It, it's interesting, and I'm, I'm glad you gave us that, that genesis, that fight with your best friend, and, and I'm curious, what happened on the other side of that? Did you, did you become friends again at some point? Well, you know, we ended up, the town I was in, he just ended up going to a different school. Mm -hmm. So we sort of never had any resolution until we were like in our early 20s. And by then, when our friend circles re-overlapped, there was no beef between us. I mean, you know, it's like... That's great. That's great. Unfortunately, you lost that time. But it sounds like that moment really fueled a great part of, of who you are. It did. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, so I, I don't want to say this about you, but most people I talk to, the vast majority I talk to, look at situations like this that in and of themselves, you could say, this was not a good thing. But if I look at how it changed the arc of my life, I'm actually glad that it happened. I definitely can say that. And especially looking, you know, there's a couple things I've learned even as a pacifist and, and it sort of started there. Um, you know, our bodies are really beautiful and precious things. But at the same time, they can really take a licking. And I have definitely taken a licking. And if that was the first nose breaking that I got, it wasn't the last. Fortunately, the very next right hook pushed my nose kind of more straight again. So, <laughs> so you just got to make sure that you get them from opposite sides and in even numbers. Exactly. Keep it symmetrical. Okay. That's important. It's, it's a good lesson for all of us. If you're going to get into an altercation, make sure you, you choose your adversary based on their, their lead hand. Exactly. All right. So you step into the class, you come out, you see the community that's formed. And, you know, it, it sounds like you really enjoyed that first class. And I would imagine that since you went in skeptical, there was some kind of, of deliberation going on as to whether or not you would go back again. Oh, yeah. I mean, for like the first year, I was waiting for the shoe to drop for me to be like, you know what, I am not, you know, I'm not gonna, so, because I didn't understand, it. I'm so, one of the things that I'm so grateful in my life too, is that the martial arts system that I found and the person that was teaching it was very clear about a couple things. So we have this rank system in a dojo, but you know, this is, United, this is the United States in the 21st century. So while the person who's my instructor and or, or as the owner of the school, or both, has a higher rank than me. You know, outside the school, we're, we're just two guys, you know, or, you know, or two people. Um, and there are skill sets that I have, or there's things that I am a master of that, that he or, or she is not. 
And so, you know, but in the school, the etiquette, and I mean, I, I think that there's a way that the story could even maybe be woven more poetically, but um, I didn't understand it at first, but I eventually came to understand the role of etiquette. And I'm grateful that my teacher expressed it like this. The role of etiquette is not to create hegemony of one person over another. Actually, he didn't use that word, but I'm paraphrasing here. Sure. Um, you know, it's not to say that I'm better than you or superior than you. Um, it is for us to cultivate mindfulness and understand our relationship to one another. From a curriculum point of view, it's like a bookmark for me to understand where you're at in what it is that you're learning and what I should be teaching you and what I can expect of you. From a mindfulness point of view, um, we're using these, you know, it's cultural appropriation in many senses. We're using these um, structures that are loosely based on, on the Japanese culture in order for us to have a, a greater awareness of our, aware, of our environment and our relationship to one another. And, you know, he was really adamant about that. And he really did um, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk on that idea. So while in the dojo, you do defer and you do show the proper etiquette, it's not meant to be this sort of mindful, mindless, rote reaction, you know, you know, bowing and, and saying a Japanese expression and calling him sensei isn't meant to be sort of like a indoctr you know, to indoctrinate you, but to actually cultivate your awareness of who you are and the choices you're making. Which I think I would have probably put a little further down the story arc, because uh, you know, like I said, that whole first year, I was always chafing under my sort of irreverent punk rock ethos. Where I, I mean, it was really kind of always at odds with me to want to make a snarky comment or to speak out of turn. Um, but I realized very early that look, you know, I'm choosing to be here. I'm choosing to come into this culture. Um, if, if we're in my house, then I'm going to curse and swear and say whatever I want to say, however inappropriate it may be. I'm in someone else's school, and it's not that hard for me to, to check in and blend a little bit. Uh, blending was never my strong suit. It's one of the most important facets of being a good martial artist, in my opinion. Um, but, what do you mean by blending? Uh, well, that's a that's a huge subject. I mean, okay. I would say, in a nutshell, two things. Blending can mean, in the very, very most physical, non metaphorical sense of the word, blending is when you're engaging with someone and you have a shared center, understanding how you can maintain your own balance in relationship to someone else's. So whether it's um, when you're sparring or engaging in a drill, it's this idea of blending means working with them with the appropriate amount of of biofeedback, of of receptivity and resistance, so that each of you can learn. Um, so blending in in a sparring situation would just be, you know, working. I mean, um, like to look at someone who's great at blending in in the martial arts. You all you have to do is look at Muhammad Ali, any one of the YouTube videos of him doing the duck and the weave, and you're like, okay, he's a master. That's literally blending with the fists coming at you, right? Um, in a more um, metaphorical sense, blending means being aware of your relationship to the people around you and in your environment, and not and neither standing out too much, nor fading into the background too much. So maintaining your your boundaries and your place in a culture, whether it's a culture that you grew up in or a culture that is alien to you, blending means being sort of um, appropriately integrated into the social uh, spheres. I like that. Yeah. Sorry for derailing you, but that, no, that, no. Seemed, that seemed like important context. Yeah, I love that. I mean, we're throwing a whole bunch of stuff up in yeah. the air. And if we're really masterful storytellers, we'll like dovetail everything and then we'll, you know, go off on our merry way. That's right. It'll happen. I have faith. I have faith as well. All right. So so you're you're working on blending, you're 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 integrating, you're in their house, and you're still carrying that that. I'm I'm doing a little bit of math, and I'm I'm, tr I'm trying to guess who who your punk band is, right? Because if <laughs> if I'm getting this right, you were you were definitely pre you know the Green Day push. So are we talking Sex Pistols? We're definitely pre Green Day. Um, by the time Green Day came out, I was kind of like ah, pre packaged punk, right? Right. I, I I heard that from a number of people who had been into punk prior. 
So that I'm, means- even a, I'm even a little bit before Nirvana. So, okay. you know, a lot of the punk that I love from that era was more of your, you know, your, your late 80s and 90s punk. So you've got like okay. Husker Du and Fugazi, okay. uh, you know, The Replacements, uh, Dead Kennedys, Dead Milkmen, a lot of stuff all over the map, you know, Black Flag, that sort of jazz. Sure. And, and you know, I, I certainly have not been, you know, I, I would not call myself a, a punk aficionado. You know, I appreciate some of the music. I certainly appreciate a lot of the uh, counter ethos that runs runs deep in that. And anybody who's had me in a martial arts class knows that just as you've expressed, you know, you, you, you don't talk out of turn. But the moment that it's a mildly appropriate to do so, I usually have a comment. Yeah. Because that's just that's my nature, yeah. and so I'm 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 hearing some of myself in what you're saying, and I'm. Did, were you able to set that down, at some point? Was there was there a moment where you said, you know what, I don't I don't need th- this is a safe place. I don't need to carry that here. Or did it fade away gradually, and you just realized it was gone one day, or are you still holding on to it now, years later? No, quite to the contrary. Something, um, what I, well, I guess you would say, I hate to say this, but a little bit more profound occurred. Okay, good. Uh, rather than so, I, I saw these these two um, sort of drives. The more I the more I learned in the martial arts, and the more um, meaningful it was to me, uh, the more I saw these forces at odds with one another. And eventually, there had to be, like you said, some sort of reckoning. And what it was it was more of a synthesis and a reconciliation where I came to understand how they're actually not at odds at all. Um, and, you know, we use the sort of symbol of the uh, yin-yang as a perfect example, right? So it's black and the, your basic yin-yang that has two elements. Uh, the white of the yang still has a black uh, element of the yin in it. Likewise, the black of the yin has the white of the yang in it. And the two are in harmony. Um, so... What I came to understand, and again, I don't think I could have got to this place had I not gone to the special school that I went to. And I cannot speak more highly of Patrick Donahue um, and his lineage of Shoenru and his other uh, practices that he brings in, because um, he also does Gojuru and teaches Gojuru, and he also teaches uh, Aikibudo, which is basically a synthesis of um, Hakoryu Jiu-Jitsu and Aikido, uh, Tamiki um, Aikido. So. Um, Patrick took mindfulness and its role as a a very important component to all that he did. And for that, I'm very grateful. Again, teasing back in the attention deficit disorder, at its very core, one of the most fundamental ways to address and treat some of the negative symptoms of ADHD or ADD is to cultivate mindfulness. what I came at for the longest time, I thought that my punk rock ethos was at odds with the sort of essence of the martial arts. And yet I came to understand that in fact, it's not. When you take some of these, um, the importance of etiquette, what is etiquette trying to do, but teach you mindfulness? What is mindfulness if not understanding volition, right? Choice. So if you become aware of something, you get to make an informed choice about how to proceed. So for me, punk rock was always about not being a robot, not being an automaton, not going through the world with blinders on, not just buying because they tell you to buy and you know wearing the clothes they tell you to wear, but finding your own true voice and expressing it passionately. Um, and all of these r- protocols are not meant to make you be robotic, but the opposite, to make you more mindful. So what I came to understand was that my martial arts practice and my exploration of the of the etiquette and the, the you know the appropriate protocols was not an antithetical to my punk rock, but really at the core, based on the same motivation of not being a robot, of not just sort of plodding along and bumping into things that you weren't aware of, but being absolutely aware of who you are and the choices you make. And when that reality kind of sunk in and from a you know, martial arts progress point of view, it happened probably late in my, I'm not proud at how long it took. I was probably about to test for my brown belt when I finally sort of 
saw those two things weave together, you know, appropriately. Um, the idea of exercising volition and not being an automaton um, helped make me understand what it is that I celebrate and also what it is that I fight for. Um, because by that time, I had also still not fully, but had begun to reconcile the idea of being a pacifist who's also a warrior studying a martial practice, um, which was not necessarily harder to uh, synthesize, but was a more ongoing and evolving process, which also continues to this day. And as, as you were, were working through that, I, I, I'm wondering if anyone was trying to help you along. And the reason being is, as you're talking about this, the, I don't, I don't think it's a quote, but this, this cliche notion of better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener on the battlefield, right? That, that concept. Were, were people trying to support you or maybe lead you or put thoughts in your head on this, this duality? Uh, there's only one person who I would have shared any of this with, and that was my, uh, my training partner and, and good friend, the person that got me into the martial arts was Station Samples. I don't know if you've interviewed him, but if you haven't, haven't. you should. He should definitely be like right up high on your list. Um, Station uh, had trained martial arts most of his life. He's a really profound thinker, um, very articulate, and also a teacher. He... Um, he he also was part of the school that I opened, um, and so in many ways he was my uh, sounding board, my foil for a lot of these ideas. And he, you know, he's a very nuanced thinker. So for him, it wasn't like, you know, he had to ha he had to be concerned about you know my psyche or 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 shove stuff down my throat. For him, it was always a dialogue and. A lot of stuff that he also had already kind of grappled with and came to terms with. So for me, like, I had never, you know, I knew, it's not like I never, when I was a full-fledged, self-avowed pacifist, it's not like I never entertained notions of caving someone's face in. I mean, I would say probably I was at least, my tendencies were at least as violent, if not maybe more so than uh, a certain portion of the population. Um, and I used to talk to people about that back before I'd even thought about becoming a martial artist, you know, where I'd say something like where I'd entertain some violent notion and express it. And someone would say, well, I thought you were a pacifist. And I, and I said, well, I am. And he would say, I remember this, this exchange. And he's like, that doesn't sound very pacifistic to me. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, like there are vegetarians who don't like to eat meat. And then there are vegetarians who love to eat meat. Um, just because they think about it and want to do it and don't doesn't mean they're not vegetarians. Likewise, it's not like I don't think about how great it would be to, uh, you know, get in a fight or solve a problem with my fists. It's just I would never do that because I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. And I think that makes me more of a pacifist than someone who just is afraid to fight or, or disinclined to. Um, that was my, again, some of my thinking leading up to becoming a martial artist. And through my through my dialogues with Tishin, we we got to explore a lot of the facets of that actually in depth. So I, I did have someone there who could really be um, be a both a mentor and a friend and a um, companion in that in that journey. Yeah. Now you mentioned something as you were talking about that that I mean we just have to make sure we get there. I don't know if it's the next step that we take, but opening your own school. Oh yes. Because we yeah. we had where we had left off, I think you said brown belt, yeah. and you know I I think it's a it would have been a fair guess from the audience that you would have kept going after that, but that's a that's a pretty big hop. Most people who even earn their black belt never go on to open a school. Yeah. So maybe you can uh, you can bring us through to that point. Totally. Um, you know, with uh, I'll just sort of stick with my my training with Patrick Donahue before yeah, I get to that. Um, one of the things that he always taught us. And again, because I'm a grown up, I came into it as an adult. I would just take these things and I could put them in a context. I, I neither had to accept them as this sort of uh, deep philosophical profundity or, you know, um, unwavering law. I mean, I could just listen and just accept this as ideas and internalize them as, as it made sense. And he always taught us that, you know, getting your black belt is sort of the equivalent of getting your, uh, kind of understanding basic grammar 
and sentence structure and vocabulary, but you know, so you can write coherent sentences, but you're by no means, it, it, it's the, the sort of, it gets you somewhere around like um, uh, in the middle school, <laughs> right? So at that point, now you can start learning how to write poetry and prose and things along these lines and utilize those tools. But, but the black belt is just getting the basics under your belt. And that's about it. And then your education as a martial artist begins. So he was really, really um, adamant about that. So I quickly and fully internalized that. Um, and even though it took whatever it took, I mean, I can't even remember now, I'm sorry to say, but I think it was like, I think it was something like five years to get my black belt, my, my showdown. But, um, you know, never felt like, oh, how come it's not faster? You know, I wasn't, I was in it not for, uh, I wasn't very goal oriented. I did like getting ranks and I love testing. Um, but I personally wasn't concerned about like seeing the black belt threshold as the end point. I definitely saw it as a point on a continuum that can, by definition, continues after that. So, um, I got my first black belt with Patrick Donahue and Sean Rue. I also, throughout that time, did um, I did study the Aikibudo with him. So I have some Q ranks in um, in his system of Aikibudo. So it's basically, like I said, Tamiki Aikido and uh, and um, Hakuyori Jiu Jitsu. Um, likewise, I have some Q ranks. I'm a basically EQ in uh, in Gojuru uh, Karate. But and while I was always training with him, I love to visit other dojos. I love to train with anyone who would let me train. So anytime I traveled, usually I'd stick in the ballpark of Shonru, but I would explore a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, some classic, I say classic, you know, like contemporary mixed martial arts, which are heavily based on the um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu system and other Rus, mostly Japanese. Sadly, I haven't done a whole lot of Chinese martial arts. I mean, just dabbled in uh, the uh, Qigong and Taiji and uh, Gung Fu. Um, you know, it's always a blast whenever I have an opportunity to do so. But um, only the dabblings literally only got so far as to say, okay, I've done that once or twice. I have the broadest framework of what it is, mm -hmm. um, but nothing that I could claim any mastery or expertise in. Um, and Patrick Donahue always encouraged us to, op to be open to other people's systems and what they have to say and to have a, a very, very analytical context of um, like trying to write balance between uh, skepticism and credulity, but um, emphasizing the idea to not dismiss something from your own ignorance, um, but neither to just sort of jump on board with an idea because of your own ignorance and to always be deferential when visiting other people's schools. Cause you know, from his perspective, we were representatives of his school. And so therefore it was incumbent upon us to maintain our best etiquette. Anytime we went to someone else's school, even if they were not formal at all. I've also trained a lot with, um, with, uh, Taekwondo players for some reason. So I have, you know, learned a few Taekwondo forms and played around with, their systems, strategies, and, you know, the things that they emphasize. But, um, there's a lot of Taekwondo in your. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that uh, always made it hard for me is I was never as flexible as most of the Taekwondo players. So mm. in that sense, my kicks look, uh, you know, a lot less dynamic than theirs. <laughs> but yeah. That, that's, that's okay. What, what single, experience do we all have that causes immense pain every time it happens banging your shin on on the corner of the bed right? <laughs> it's one of the most painful things right it just happened to me the other night and and it reminded me that i've been doing this my entire life it still hurts like i'll get out and you know the beauty of a shin is everybody can reach it yep yep exactly thank you <laughs> so um and then i mean to give you a quick like fast forward arc ahead um i continued to train with patrick donahue i was uh awarded the rank of sensei as a teacher i always loved teaching just i just i love being on both sides of that process um there's nothing like being uncomfortable and learning and there's nothing 
that helps you understand your own learning process as trying to convey it to someone else. I mean, one of the most basic principles I learned early on is the stuff that was easy for me to, to learn uh, was harder for me to teach. And the stuff that was harder for me to teach was easier for, I mean, harder for me to learn was easier for me to teach. So, um, you know, ukeme always came easy to me. And I had to really struggle to learn how to teach ukeme. Um, if that makes any sense. Why do you think that is? Why, why the flip flop? Um, very, you know, because I just sort of learned ukeme, I didn't have to analyze it at any point. You know, I just, they showed me what to do. I went and did it. They corrected me a little bit. I, I took the corrections. I kept practicing and my ukeme got better. Um, and because it came so easy, it never occurred to me what would be the impediments to doing it correctly. Do you know what I mean? Whether it's structural, psychological, or otherwise. So when I was in the position of teaching, I quickly learned that one of the hardest things to teach for me was ukeme. Um, you know, and over time, because it's such an important part of, I mean, you know, if I was going to give one sort of martial arts uh, anecdote about this incredible martial art experience that I have, it would have nothing to do with thwarting a mugger or, you know, tracking down, you know, a person trying to do violence to someone else or interceding in a violent altercation. It was 100% me. Do you know what Heelys are? I do. I had a pair of Heelys as an adult man. I, you know, I'm going along. did I. Oh, you did? <laughs> I did. See, we have this in common. I did. So, you know, I'm going along in my Heelys and I'm on my cell phone talking to my girlfriend and I was in a parking lot and I caught a stone in my Heelys and they only have one wheel per foot. So, you know, it stops you right up. And I'm flying through the air, watching the pavement rise towards me. And instinctively, my hand goes out, you know, to protect myself. And the second you know, the heel of my palm touched the pavement. I, I tucked and rolled and came back up and I never even took my cell phone away from my ear, you know? And I, and I, I, I just stopped rolling. I started walking and my friend who was behind me rushed up and he was incredibly excited. He's like, Oh my God, Daniel, I thought, you know, we we're going to pick your dentures out of the pavement, but you know, here you are still on the phone, you know? And I, I processed that and thought, okay, well, that wasn't instinctual. You know, that wasn't my body doing what it thought it ought to do. That was training. That was my martial arts training. And I tell my students and my peers all the time, you may never have to fight a terrorist, you know, but if you live in New England, you will almost certainly fall. And if you can learn how to fall, then you will be, all the money that you invest in your training will pay itself back with dividends. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, I, I actually know someone who part of their professional career is taking what they learned as an Aikidoka in, in Aikido about fall training and breaking that down and teaching the fall components to the elderly. Yeah, yeah. And, and those are the people... You know, if you can learn it before you get elderly, you're even better off. Absolutely. All right. Um, but so, yes, I think we were kind of going through a yeah. major overarching. Yeah, keep it going. And um, then eventually I, 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 I did achieve under um, Patrick's, um, uh, Patrick's teaching a fourth degree black belt in Shonen Karate. And sometime right around there, circumstances there was a lot of upheavals in his school and circumstances had me uh, withdraw from, from the Brattleboro School of Budo as a formal student. Uh, after that time, you know, there's a lot, a lot going on here in Brattleboro and in, in the martial arts and the people who, who had trained. I was 100% committed to continuing my training. And so I was working in a very ad hoc way um, for the next year or so, basically in my barn um and in my backyard with whoever felt like doing something and i at that time i was doing a little bit of everything including some um you know i had a um uh, what do they call it uh why am i blanking um what's the uh makawara no the um the i think it's 
Muay Thai. You know, I had a Muay Thai guy. Oh, okay, and yeah. He and I would come and we'd do pad drills together. And, you know, I was just doing a little bit of everything. And eventually I, um, I hooked up with, with my, my neighbor who was uh, a Weichiru practitioner. And we did a lot of training and thinking and talking, training and thinking and talking. And there were a bunch of kids who were looking for an instructor. And so we sort of, you know, our school evolved really organically just because there were some kids who were looking for some extra, you know, study. So we would do some stuff at the Guilford, at the Guilford School. And we had a little space in the back of the Outer Limits Gym where we were doing our classes and then the next thing you know, you have an LLC and an insurance policy and, uh, and, and you're defining your curricul- curriculum and setting up a school schedule and getting a website. And then the next thing you know, we had a really great, awesome space in the Cotton Mill Hill building. And we had, some, we had a core of really amazing and dedicated students. And um, so that's how I opened our school, which was called Sangha based on the um, the Japanese term, which loosely is more f- sort of formally interpreted as a, as a, um, a yoga school or a school of, uh, not sorry, yoga, um, a, a, I believe it's a Buddhist community. Sangha is the Buddhist community, and a lot of times it'll come into yoga. Mm-hmm. But for us, um, we use the term more loosely just to mean community. Um, the Sangha is the spirit of the community. And so we were Sangha Martial Arts, LLC. I'm sure as you were getting ready to open that school, you were thinking a lot about your your journey. And as someone who's opened the school, I remember that first day, I remember standing in front of that class. It, you, you could spend years, decades teaching, but the moment it's your class, your students, and you're completely responsible for them, things are different. So I'm wondering that first day, you know, in, in front of that class, it's all formalized. This is what you're doing. Was there any reflection on the, the genesis? Let's bring it full circle. And knowing that you had been reluctant when you stepped in there, did that enter your mind and maybe inform the way that you ran or even still run things? Constantly. Um, our school did close after um, two years. But, uh, I, from the beginning, from day one, you know, I was always, well, collectively, my business partner and I, and we brought station samples on as well as a sort of um, leader of the school. There was always a dialogue about how to find that balance between being a legitimate, you know, resource what are what the what we and what we hope to emphasize in our curriculum and never forgetting our own you know process i mean my business partner had been training since he was something like 8 years old right so he he had almost a decade of more of training than i had when i opened the school um with him and and i know that he shared the sentiment that neither one of us ever forgot that uh well, in fact, it was kind of a core principle of his, this idea of always always operating with with an acknowledgement of the beginner's mind within ourselves to be able to sort of try to keep that perspective to remind us. And, you know, not just for checking our egos, but but really remembering, look, there was a time when you didn't know a single, you know, we, we spoke, we speak a lot of dojoese, right? Japanese words that have come to have meaning in, in the American culture and American martial arts culture. But, you know, there was a time when I didn't know a single one, you know, I didn't know how to count in Japanese. I didn't know. And, you know, one of my favorite sort of anecdotes about speaking Japanese is I didn't know the difference between Giri, Giri, or Giri, you know, um, one's a kick, one's obligation and one's diarrhea, um, depending on how you sort of spell it. Uh, so I always try to keep that in mind with, with, especially with, um, new students. You know, when we were starting off, a bunch of our students had had some martial arts background. So even though it was our first day of classes, it sort of was, there was already, um, an established, you know, it was, people understood what was going on. They weren't kind of in there with this, um, bushy tailed, you know, naivete, 
we, we had a lot of new students as well, but we had some veterans already and that sort of made the transition easier. So you mentioned closing the school. So what next? Um, well, it's been a, it's been a dark time in the force for Daniel. Um, closing the school was, uh, as you can imagine, a real psychological and emotional blow. And since then, um, I've been only doing exclusive trainings with individuals who want to kind of focus on specific facets of our curriculum. So most of the people that I train with now are people who have um, shared or, or overlapping backgrounds with me. Um, I don't, we don't work formally. We work uh, usually wearing, um, you know, t-shirt, sweatpants. I still like to work barefoot a lot, but I have, you know, some um, indoor sneakers that I use as well. And so since the school is closed, almost all of my training has been towards maintaining what I have learned, um, working with people who have also learned it to some degree. So there's analysis and an interaction on that level or training with people who have, uh, they may not have the same background, but they have the shared love so i'll work with um you know the muay thai guy or i'll work with uh you know a, a capoeira guy and you know we'll be all over the map a lot of times just doing drills that where there's universality as we've spoken the the common thread here you know really is is thoughtfulness and analysis and really um, I, I would guess that early on you might have called it overthinking. But as we've spoken, it sounds like that thing, that attribute that some might have termed a liability. And, and you know, as you've spoken, I, the, the similarities between you and I are, are huge. Open my own school, close it after two years, you know, and there's, and, and there's plenty more. And, uh, a bit of what you've defined as, as ADD is very real to me. So I'm wondering if, if you've been aware of that, of that unpacking, that exploration of what you've done as a martial artist and the recognition that it's not what everyone does. Well, I, I hadn't ever considered comparing myself to other martial artists in that way or other people in general. I do know that I've had you know, that overthinking impulse, that sort of perseveration. And then that's where the physical part, you know, comes in. Um, you know, part of mindfulness, I guess, like, um, what is it? it the, we had we had a tapestry up in our school, and it was, um, oh, yes, uh, Mushin, Mushin, which, you know, you take these Japanese terms, they're often very, very difficult to translate into uh american mindsets people so argue I took about those in, definitions pardon me people will argue about those definitions right and you know i think there's a there's a place for a degree of arguing sure. especially if the goal of the argument is to have greater understanding you know a, a greater shared understanding and you know at the same time like i'm not so i'm a formally trained fellow but i'm not really sort of academically rigorous um and that has been a bone of contention for me and some martial artists. I do like to think and I do like to analyze, but um, I'm also happy to just trust uh, a, a certain extent that my understanding is as good as it needs to be. And as long as I'm trying to make it greater, then then that's okay. Um, so when you take something like Mushin, um, Mushin can be, I'd like to hear if you have an understanding of the, of the phrase, but my understanding is sort of like a mind of no mind, right? So it's this sort of, um, Mushin is this sort of place that you get to where you are receptive, but not reactive. You are, you are aware, but you're not focused. It, it, does that make sense? There's a, a bit of a um, uh, mind of no mind by yeah. its definition has a sort of, um, a, a, a contradiction of terms within itself. And yeah. so, you know, within that, it's been very helpful to get to use the physical components of martial arts and the moving mindfulness practice as a way of balancing what we might think of as perseveration, which would be taking us away from Mushin, 
you know, where Mushin, you are, you're in your mind, but you're not stuck in your mind or you're beyond your mind, but your mind is turned on. Um, so definitely martial arts have helped me. And when I'm physically and more physically fit and more physically active work, um, towards Mushin, which again could easily segue also into uh, attention deficit disorder in the sense that I don't know if you know anything about it or have done any research, but for the mind of a person with attention deficit disorder, when their mind is under stress, and I don't just mean like stressed out, like I'm having a, a stressful day, but under stress, meaning I'm going to ask you, how do I get from here to Minneapolis? You know, you'd have to like start working your neurons. Um, for an AD, ADD person, when they're under stress, what happens a lot of time is their brain actually locks up, it shuts down. So um, they can be the smartest fellow in the room, but the words coming out of their mouth sound like borderline gobbledygook. And nothing like the physical fitness component and the physical, uh, you know, the kinesthetic knowledge that you cultivate in martial arts helps you ride the wave of your mental lockup, you know, your gear, your gear jams and into a more flowing mind state. So like I always describe it as surfing. And the, the more I'm practicing, the more I'm training, the easier it is for me to ride the waves of, of my strange um, awarenesses and, and mental connections and get away from either perseveration or a sort of brain lock. I can relate to that a bit. You know, one of the things that, you know, I, I've heard as a reoccurring theme in your programs has to do with the emphasis on and the relationship to the formal components of the martial arts. And, and especially when I was opening my own school, and to this day, you know, it's been one of those uh, very complicated and nuanced conversations on, a, on an intellectual level. And on an emotional level, it's definitely a love-hate sort of thing. Um, you know, I had no idea that I would love the regimentation of martial arts. It would have never occurred to me. And yet, it really offered me a full 100% ability to get into a different mindset. You know, when you put that, you, why do we wear a karate uniform? Um, is it the best thing to train in? Nope. I wouldn't say it's the best thing to train in. Is it help you learn any good martial arts skills by wearing that uniform? I mean, yeah, if you fight a guy wearing a martial arts uniform, it definitely helps you out with that. Um, but one of the biggest things I always felt that it did and why I advocated using a formal uniform in our school, even if it wasn't a gi, it could just be, and we talked about what kind of uniform we were going to end up with, and where we kind of got to at the end was um, the pants of a gi, but a t-shirt and your belt to show your rank. I mean, the rank also is a huge subject of conversation. I'm sure you've had people touch on that. Oh, yeah. We've, um, we've probably done a dozen episodes around rank. You, I, you, how couldn't you? I mean, it's, and the problem is like we talked and talked and talked about it. And everyone, that, the, the three people that were involved in my school, Matt Hoffman, Steve and Samples, and myself, Really, we never argued about it. We weren't arguing. <laughs> we at, at, at one moment, all three of us would think it's the greatest idea on the planet. At the next moment, all three of us would think it was the dumbest idea on the planet. You know, so those conversations were pretty funny because we never achieved consensus because we never found consensus within ourselves. Um, but for me, I often came back to my leaning that the role of rank in a modern dojo if it's one used as a bookmark for um, the teacher to help understand the curriculum that you've already been, been introduced to, uh, second one being that um, there are a lot of people in this world that really respond to the carrot and the goals and the achievements and the recognition of those achievements. I would say that I'm not deeply, I don't deeply love that, but I actually also like the sense of achievement that comes with those things. And then the third thing was, you know, sort of, um, and it really was sad to come down to this, but a marketing uh, perspective where you can just say, look, it's, a, it's something that people already culturally identify with in America. 
you know, they understand these sort of ranks that they achieve. And from a, from a monetary and marketing point of view, it kind of makes sense. So um, in the end, we ended up deciding to keep rank. And some of those reasons were quite philosophical and theoretically the benefits outweighed the negatives. And some of them were, you know, kind of monetary. So what's next? What What's going on now? You talked a bit about your training now and, and working one-on-one with people, but have you given any thought to the future and your training, teaching, relationship to martial arts and, and what that might hold? I really appreciate you asking me that question. I should point out that I had some trepidations about, you know, this conversation because in many ways the future is opaque to me. And kind of like when I first started martial arts, you know, I was given this diagnosis and I knew I wanted to make changes in my life. And my plan at the time was not to try to change anything and, you know, try to change everything in some massive, uh, gestalt, but just to take small steps in the direction that I wanted to go. Um, and as you asked me that question pointedly, uh, respectfully, and I check in with the answer, um, the answer is simple. I want to slowly continue to gather the people, because one of the things that I love about the martial arts is that it is a system that you do with others. And yes, I, I do my kata by myself, and um, I can do calisthenics by myself. I like doing push-ups with somebody doing push-ups next to me. And you can not you can do kotiki tai against some sort of makiwara, but nothing is like feeling when someone's shin hits your shin versus hitting the bed. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, um, you know, I have some hesitation about speaking in grandiose terms or being too ambitious. My short-term goals are to continue training with the people that I train with. And I would be lying if if I didn't say that, you know, I'm building this artist residency uh, event space here in Guilford, Vermont. I have a space that I call the dojo. And um, whether or not it ever becomes a formal school again. Um, certainly invigorating and formalizing trainings with people who are committed to self-improvement, mind, the cultivation of mindfulness, and exploring these principles of um, self-defense, physical fitness, and longevity. I know that's a really ambiguous answer to your question, but Honestly, I wouldn't have expected anything else. Yeah. You're being open. You're, you're, you're open to possibilities. You're recognizing that the path that you've been on has not been a, a straightforward one. And I, I would argue that none of our paths are. You know, what, what's, what's the joke? Uh, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. That's right. That's a good quote. <laughs> and, and so what, when, I, when I ask this question, and I ask it, I, I think I ask it every episode. I try to anyway. You know, really, the, the, I think at the heart of what I'm asking is, what are you hopeful for and what's important to you? I think that's what it comes down to. And that's what we heard. You answered those two questions, but I think it's a, a more, um, I think it's an easier question for people to answer to say, you know, what are you looking forward to? Because when I ask people what they're hopeful for or what's important to them, there tends to be a lot of self-judgment. Mm. And I don't yeah. like that filter. A lot of the questions that I ask have come from a lot of refinement over the years, just as we would refine a technique or a form or our strategy in sparring because we're looking to elicit a certain result. And that's, that's what we got. So I'm, I'm thrilled. You know, also there is another important part of it that I've mostly struggled with. Um, I've always believed that no teacher can be a good teacher unless they have a teacher. Um, so one of the things I've struggled with and COVID has only made this more challenging is what's next in terms of my teacher. Um, you know, I've trained with a lot of great people and none of them are nearby. (laughs) 
And I mean, I, sh- I should say a lot of the people I've trained with are nearby, but none of them that were my teacher. Um, so, so I, I've been, I have not been proactive in finding my next teacher. So there is absolutely no question that at some point that needs to be invigorated. Well, it, I mean, there, there's another Greek cliche there on that subject. And I, I bet most of you in, in can finish that when, when the student's ready, right? All right. I, I, I've, I've gone through phases where I didn't have someone that I would look to and say, this is my teacher. And COVID aside, you know, I, I now have multiple people that I look to yeah. for my, my martial arts progress. And I'm, I'm sure that will change, you know, not necessarily how many, but, but who? Because it has to. Because life changes. And our martial arts changes accordingly. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. There, One of the things that I've kind of, and my wife's been very supportive of this process with me. Um, but, you know, part of the challenge is one of the great things about having Patrick Donahue in the Brattleboro School of Budo is from where I live right now, I could get to that dojo in 15 minutes, you know? Um, and that's, and he also had a lot of classes. There were times when I trained, and I'm sure you've been in these phases, I would train seven days a week, you know, well, or I would go to seven adult classes and three kids classes a week. Um, sometimes, you know, multiple classes a day. And my life can't quite facilitate that level of commitment right now. But, um, when you start adding, instead of 15 minutes, it's 45 minutes or, or an hour, then that becomes a significant impediment right now, which is a god-awful excuse. And yet it's one that I um, bump up against quite. Because, um, you know, like you said, maybe my teacher is in Brattleboro right this minute, but I haven't met them yet. <laughs> mm. or, or I haven't re-met them. Right. But, you know, one of my favorite things about martial arts, because I, I've I've the depth, uh, the volume, I guess, of my training has fluctuated a great deal over the time that I've been a martial artist. But one of the things that I, I found myself saying, because people will come to me as a result of this show, people come to me and they they're embarrassed. You know, and, and anyone who's ever been a martial arts stru- instructor knows this, that a former student will come to you. You see them at the grocery store. Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to. I've really been thinking about coming back to class. I, I, I'm thinking I'll see you next month, right? And it doesn't happen, but they're embarrassed, right? They feel guilty. Yeah. There's, a, there's a sense there. And doing what we do here and doing what I do on this show, I get people writing me and I see them at competitions or, or whatever. And, and they say the same thing. And over the years, I found myself responding in a very similar way. Martial arts is there for you when you're ready. Yep. You, don't ha- you don't have to feel guilty. You don't... You, you, you aren't holding anyone else back. You don't have to carry that burden. When it's time, it's time. And I think that that is, for me, the most beautiful thing about martial arts is that it it is as much or as little as you want it to be in your life. And it's still valid. Yep. I would agree. I I love those, it's sort of, this might be slightly tangential from that, but I love those pod, you know, you get to these points where let's say, um, you know, you're, you're starting off in martial arts and your teacher is trying to teach you to keep your tongue, your tongue, your thumb tucked in, right? So when you're doing a shoot though, okay, you know, you keep you your, your tongue, tucked, your tongue in, like, tucked in as well. You can keep your tongue tucked in as well. <laughs> so let's not bite that off. But, you know, and then there comes a point where you uh, find yourself walking down the street and you see a friend across the street and you wave to them. And then you look at your hand and your thumb is tucked in. You're waving to some guy across the street with your thumb tucked in. And you're like, okay, that's weird. But, you know, it's, you know, over a decade now into my, my journey here, I still love seeing all the little things that I have a different awareness of because of my martial arts background. Whether it's, you know, watching a movie and seeing Oh, that guy obviously, whoever taught that, you know, whoever taught Tom Cruise how to do that clearly had, you know, military training, probably with Okinawan background, you know, um, because that's 
that's how it, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and to this day, that that's a relationship that hasn't left me. You know, I may not do my kata multiple times or per day as I used to, um, but I still do my kata, and I still see the world a little differently. And I owe a significant portion of that to people like Patrick Donahue and his teaching samples and Matt Hoffman and 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 uh, and Andrew and Sensei Matt Butler and the many other people who I've had the great opportunity to train with over the years. Well, we've covered it. I mean, we, we, I'm sure, as I said at the beginning, we could probably talk for hours more, but I think this is a good place to wind down. I think so as well. And you've covered a, a huge amount, and I want to thank you for your, your openness, your candor, uh, your trust in, in myself and in this audience to share such, such deep aspects of your story. And you know, I've, I've got a feeling that we'll, we'll probably hear from you again at some point, you know, especially so. your, your ties to Andrew and everything and his, his growing role in the show. Shout out to Andrew. I appreciate you, my friend. But I'd like you to send us out. And you, if you've, you've listened to episodes, you know how we do this. So it's, it's up to you. What, what do you want to leave the audience with as we roll out to the outro here? I suppose I'll stick with the one subject that we had touched upon. I'll end with this. Um, is the idea that through my explorations as a martial artist, the one thing that I have um, come to understand deeply had to do with this idea of pacifism and our own waking power, our ability to exercise volition and to not be automatons. And my relationship to the idea of pacifism has changed dramatically in the time that I've been training as a martial artist, going from the idea that um, it's been so great to be in a safe environment to observe people's relationships to violence, to the strange cultural taboos that we have around violence and how those are the direct, uh, you know, it's the, you know, the obverse of our, our fascination, fixation, and, and love of violence. Um, I've come to understand that the word pacifism falls so far short of the, philosoph the philosophy that I try to implement in my life. Uh, it's anything but passive. It's the opposite of passive. It's active. Um, but activism has its own you know, meanings. Um, I've come to understand that learning to own your power uh, on any level, to know your power, is one of the greatest gifts that the martial arts practice can do, especially for people who feel um, as if their power has been thwarted, undermined, or in some way stifled. Um, people who've been abused often turn to martial arts, and it's a great healing vehicle for them to confront, confront demons and to learn how to lean into discomfort, um, whether it's uh, you know, people who have, you know, to become inoculated to touch for people who have touch sensitivities. You know, for me, it was so vital to understand that, that I'm a warrior, that I fight for a thing, I fight for a set of values, and that I take my fight very seriously, and that my fight is a noble one. And far from being a pacifist, I've come to understand that 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 power expresses itself on a, in a wide range of um, it manifests in a vast many number of ways, and it's an ongoing process to become better at it. But um, I'm grateful for have to have the opportunity to learn how to lean into discomfort how to not shirk my responsibilities, how to set up and assert myself in super powerful and super respectful ways that, you know, I would have never done before. I would have been passive aggressive or, or felt frustrated and stymied. Um, I'm a grown man. I have a great gift. I have a great amount of power that I'm able to access. And to be able to sit with that and hold it and, it it certainly makes me, I was never very likely to get in a fight to begin with. I'm all that much less likely to get in a fight now, a fist fight. But the idea of redirecting 
violent uh, expressions, uh, aggressions, uh, to interact with and to receive um, people's energies. God, you know, those are gifts that maybe you could have got through some other type of therapeutic process or education, but I mean, nothing makes it so internalized as the martial arts. Um, and I mean, I could just continue to talk about, you know, power dynamics and our culture's relationship to violence and compare that to other cultures and histories. But at this point, the one thing that really juices me specifically about martial arts more than any other discipline is that, that beautiful exploration and, and the gift that there is within it. So remember back in the intro when I said that today's episode kind of defied a neat boxed up intro see what i'm talking about i had an absolute blast with this conversation and i'm incredibly thankful that sensei came on and was willing to talk to me he told me to call him daniel so i guess i, I should call him daniel thank you daniel thank you for your time thank you for your willingness to open up i'm recording this outro a little bit after the recording you know not immediately after as i usually do and that's because the wheels are still turning I'm still trying to figure out how to unpack this one enough in my mind that I can start to digest it. I don't pretend that everybody listens to the episodes in the same way. I don't expect that you do the same thing when you listen to a show that I do when I listen to this or honestly any podcast. But I would guess that this one hit a little differently, hopefully in a good way. And that's because the conversation we had wasn't a normal conversation for this show. Yeah, we talked about martial arts, and yeah, we talked about personal stuff, but the arc of the conversation was a bit different. I got the sense that Daniel prepared and had things that he really wanted to say. In fact, he said that during the intro. There were some things that were important to him to say, and I think that that came through. So again, thank you, and thank you to all of you for listening. If you want more, if you want to see the photos and the links and all that, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You're going to see stuff for this and every other episode we've ever done. And if that means something to you, if you want to make sure that this show keeps going, if you want to support us, and I hope you do, do something, anything would be appreciated. Sharing an episode, telling friends, leaving reviews on whatever podcast platform you use or Facebook or Google or Patreon, you know, contributing there, buy, making a purchase at whistlecake.com. It, no, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what you do. I just, I want to know that you value what we do. It, it means a lot more than I think you may realize. If you see somebody out there wearing something with a whistle kick, say hi. We're building something here and you're part of it. And you can help us spread what we're doing. It's all about the traditional martial arts. And if you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. That's it. That's all I've got for you today. So until next time. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.